Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. I dream I am lost in a woods, searching. A path leads out of the darkness. The trees are watching. The trees are watching. Hello, my name is Bob Whitaker, and today we'll be speaking with Don Sonatog and Kermit Cole about an opera they have created titled For Life. This opera is, I think, rather unique for I don't know of any other opera that explores the foibles of, of psychiatry and the harm that the psych- psychiatric drugs can cause. Don is an award-winning composer whose works have been commissioned and performed by the Cleveland Opera Theater, the Hartford Opera Theater, and have been performed at numerous music festivals in the United States and Canada. Her first opera, for which she also composed the libretto, is a finalist in the 2021 American Prize for Opera. Kermit Cole is well known to readers of Madden America. He was one of the founders of Madden America and served as the editor for the first four years. He also has a background in film. When he was young, he toured Europe as part of a mime troupe. And in the past 20 years, he's also become uh, trained in open dialogue therapy. And he has a lifelong love of playing with words. He's a fan of crosswords, and he recently created one for Madden America. He wrote the libretto for the opera. This opera, For Life, will premiere online, and there will be a discussion afterwards, and you'll need to register for the discussion afterwards. We'll give you information about how to find the opera at the end of this interview. Welcome, Don, and welcome, Kermit. It's nice to have you here today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Hello. It's great to be here. Don, before we dive into the uh, composition of this opera, can you tell us a bit about your path to becoming a composer? and the themes that you explored in your previous works. Yes, I always had a strong inclination to compose, but uh, my path first began as a performer. I was trained as a a vocalist and a pianist, and I I also studied conducting. And um, it was uh, uh, not a straight and narrow path towards composing, but I always knew that I would land there at some point, and which I actually first started uh, seriously composing. I had actually thrown away everything I had written before I became a doctoral student uh, at the University of Minnesota. I studied voice performance and composition during my doctoral studies. And because I have sung opera myself and have worked extensively as a, a vocal coach, as a pianist who works with singers. And so, although in the beginning I never thought, oh, I think I'll compose opera, but then it suddenly became a, an obvious choice. Uh, and I started looking for librettos and I couldn't find anything that really spoke to me. And I decided I needed to write my my own libretto, so I needed to find a story. And so my very first opera, Verlorene Heimat, which is German for Lost Homeland, that is a true story of my family's experience as they were ethnic Germans living in Eastern Europe and were refugees and Nazi resistors during World War II, they sheltered a Jewish girl and and hid her, actually, or her identity from the Nazis, and they were penalized for the resistance. So um, it was my mother-in-law who shared this story with me, and so I made that into an opera, and then that opera was one uh, honorable mention in the American Prize for Opera this year. That's an extraordinary life story. Did you live in Germany for a time? Well, I was, I lived in Germany for nine years. I studied there and I worked there and I met my husband there. So his parents lived in Germany. So I um, 
I was actually living there when I first heard the story. And then we came, I, I moved back to the States in 2000 after nine years there. So obviously this is a theme that you explored in your first opera. And where has that been performed? I directed it at Hiram College with my students there when I was teaching there. So the first performance was in uh, 2015 and with my students. And from that recording, I sent excerpts to the Hartford Opera and to the Cleveland Opera Theater. And both of them first performed scenes and then the Cleveland Opera uh, artistic director, Scott Skiba, produced the entire opera, staged it on, um, and it was, so the professional premiere was on World Holocaust Memorial Day in 2018. So they did two wonderful productions that year. So you can see from this first opera how, uh, you know, your creative work um, comes out of, you know, a personal story, uh, something very close to you. So the obvious question now is, how did you become interested in this world of psychiatric drugs and the possible harm that can come? Because I imagine there's a personal uh, connection to this subject. Yes. Well, interestingly, right after the Fellow in a Heimat production with the Cleveland Opera Theater, Scott Skiba mentioned to me that he was interested in creating an opera about the opioid epidemic, which in Northeastern Ohio was a huge problem. And I I said, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd be interested in working on that. Um, but then I just sort of forgot about it because um, that, at that point, was not at all part of my life, the op opioid, or I didn't, I didn't realize it, I guess. And then I learned in uh, a couple years later about benzodiazepines through the experience of a family member who was very adversely affected. And I started reading um, and searching for answers and the, the very first article that I found on benzodiazepines was the story of Christy Huff, MD, the uh, founded uh, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. And from there, I actually went to searching through PubMed articles. Um, I have to take a, a short step back a few years earlier. I had taught a course on music and the brain with a colleague who is a neuroscience professor at Hiram College. And he told me how dangerous psychiatric medications were at that time. And this was back like 2013. And I had just sort of forgotten about this. But then he talked about Finland and how they had stopped uh, using these medications and were using other methods to help take people out of their stressful environment and so on and how they had had much success with this. So when I started seeing what was happening with the benzodiazepines and I started reading and I learned that it wasn't just the benzodiazepines but also antidepressants and antipsychotics, it was like opening the veil of hell or something. It was just <laughs> so, so many questions suddenly were clearly answered. Things that I had observed in more than one family member who were really severely adversely affected by these medications. And I also then, I thought, well, there must be I wonder if there's anything on social media about this. And as soon as I started searching, I found that there were many groups for uh, individuals who had been harmed by these medications and who were uh, trying to withdraw from them and who were experiencing the same things that I was seeing in my own family members. And so there were thousands of people in these groups. And so um, reading about their experiences uh, that confirmed what I was seeing. And I then I began finding lectures by Dr. Joanne uh, Moncrief and David Healy. And I, I, I discovered Mad in America. I was just searching everywhere for answers. And I was 
I was encouraged that there were others that recognized the problem, but I was also rather horrified about how how widespread the the problem is. And most most of all, I was appalled about how the uh, members of these support groups would repeat over and over again that they would go to their physicians and say, I'm having these effects. And the, the physicians would say, it can't be the drugs. And that they didn't know what these drugs really do to the brain. So these support groups, these people are actually, um, the administrators actually of many of them are very well organized. They have resources available for the members. And this is where the members are going to get help. In many cases, they're not getting any help from their physicians. So Don, you discover this subject, which obviously is affecting so many lives. And it's a, it's a whole story that, you know, as you discovered, it's, it's, you can discover it on online. You can unfortunately discover it with personal connections, but it, you don't really discover it so much in the general media for sure. But you discover it. You think it's important. Obviously, there's a, you have this personal reason because you're seeing the harm that can come. But then why would this be a good subject for an opera? I mean, there's a lot of people who write about it, write critiques, but how does, taking what you see as such an important subject, why think about doing an opera? In what way can an opera help explore these themes, explore this this suffering and that sort of thing? I think it's because an opera makes it personal rather than some abstract problem that's happening to other people. And the combination of the text and the music that is... a the subtext for all the things that the words actually fail to capture. So if you're a lay person, when I mean a lay person, I mean uh, someone who has no idea about the harm that these medications do. And you, and you say the word akathisia, and they'll say, what's that? And then you'll say, well, it's a movement disorder. Oh, well, you know, that must be better than anxiety or psychosis so what's the big deal you know and until you've actually seen someone or or kind of in opera the the goal is of course that the viewer sort of um is drawn into the story so that they're they're feeling and experiencing it themselves and i think that's why people who do love opera that's that's why they go so there's a sense you're going to be able to experience the suffering and the, oh, I don't know, the, the isolation that can come to people suffering from this, the, the, that you're not understood by others. So there's an intimacy with opera that, uh, that brings the, I guess, the audience in close contact with the subject and the emotional tenor of that subject. Yeah, that, that's really it. And the thing is, is that a lot of people think, many people think that opera if they're not very familiar with opera, they're only familiar with a metropolitan opera. And, and these big opera houses do always repeat the old um, 19th century operas by Puccini and, you know, Verdi and Mozart. And these are beautiful operas that also elicit emotion. And But opera is not just especially American opera these days, there are all kinds of subject matters that are now being presented and stories told through opera, all sorts of different issues. And um, operas are not always two hours long. It, this is a micro opera festival. So our opera is 30 minutes and it's the longest one. Some of them are 10 or 15 minutes. You know, that's really great because I think we do have this sort of... Um stereotyped image of what opera does and how it presents com coming from going to, you know, performances at the big opera halls. So you, you come to meet Kermit or, or the, I guess the question is, how did you get him to join you in this effort? And also you had written librettos before. So just real quickly, how did you recruit Kermit into this and think of this partnership? Yeah, I, I wrote the libretto for actually I've written, uh, I have a half 
full scale opera done called Cold Creek. It's about Alaska. And I did research for that and wrote my own libretto as well, or in the in the process of writing it. And then I wrote another mini opera on the story of uh, uh, Longfellow's poem, Evangeline, that was the basis, but I wrote it. And I was also very fearful of writing librettos before I started doing it. And then I figured out my own system and my own way of doing it. But for this opera, I actually didn't want to be alone in the responsibility for talking about this issue. I feared that uh, without the collaboration of someone, um, a professional in the mental health field, that I would be viewed as completely off the wall conspiracy theory, not knowing what I was talking about. And so I wanted to ask for advising on this libretto. And I had seen on the Madden America site that Kermit had the background in theater and film. And so I contacted him and just said, I have this idea uh, for composing this opera. And I had already then, I had already mentioned this to Scott Skiba. So before I contacted Kermit, Scott and I uh, had had discussed it. And, you know, I was, I was just going to write the libretto myself. And then I thought, I, I really would like some help with this. So I contacted Kermit and I was thrilled that he said, well, I'd like to write it. And I thought this is really good because it does take a lot of burden off of me. Um, although as a composer, any texts that you set are automatically, you are, you know, tied to those texts and it is assumed that you believe the text which I do. That's not always like there are composers who set things that they don't actually believe. But in this case, I absolutely do. Great. All right, Kermit. I've known Kermit for a long time. Um, and Kermit uh, does bring a variety of talents to this uh, work. You have a background in film, and I know you produced, directed, and wrote a documentary film about people living with HIV in the 1990s. You were per uh, part of a, a, a troupe that toured Europe a long time ago uh, doing mime presentations, if I remember. So you have this background in, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, in, in theater, in, in film, and in creative work. And of course, you've spent 20-some years very much engaged with the psychiatric world as a editor for Mad in America and as a therapist, uh, someone who studied open dialogue. And that's what Dawn was talking about when she spoke about alternatives with um, how Finland, Northern Finland was treating psychotic patients. That said, and I know you love words, you're an expert at uh, crossword puzzles, but still obviously questions, what made you think you could write a libretto? And especially for such an accomplished composer. And so what are the resources you uh, felt you could bring to this? And and how did you manage to convince Don you were the one? Well, I didn't. I didn't think I could write a libretto, but uh, I would say it dawned on me that I could write a libretto. <laughs> uh, that uh, I mean, as as we talked about, as we talked about it, uh, I mean, a number of things cro crossed my mind. Uh, first was, you know, if we could create something that had half the depth of the conversations that Lou, that Don and I were having, and something that was a fraction as entertaining as it was. Uh, for Don and I to speak with each other, uh, then we, you know, we, we'd probably make something pretty good. I just enjoyed our conversations, and so the idea of working together was, you know, something I couldn't couldn't pass up. Um, but more than that, also uh, the story that she wanted to tell. It's what I, you know, it's it's the thing that I've. It's just the kind of thing I've been looking for all along. I mean, I'd say, I mean, whether it was you know, theater or film or it's all been about, you know, trying to understand things, trying to understand the world, um, trying to make sense out of things I've seen and experienced and come up with some way to talk about them. And so, you know, that led me to make that documentary. Uh, there were things about, th you know, what was happening in in the world, the world of 
people with HIV at the time, which was a world I didn't understand at all. I didn't, when I went to make that film, I hadn't been in that world, but I had the opportunity to go into it and learn about it and experience it. And that gave me a taste for working with people who were confronting real life challenges that I really hadn't, you know, had an opportunity to do on that level before. And it led me, ultimately led me to going back to school uh, because I wanted to go deeper. Uh, and I didn't want to be encumbered by a camera or an obligation to tell that story to people who may or may not understand it. So ultimately I spent, you know, the past 20 years focusing on being with people uh, in the crisis they were in without any, with not, not, you know, without trying to disentangle myself from any political or, you know, other uh, intentions other than being with that person. Was I realized that, you know, one of the big pivotal moments for me was going back to school at, after making that AIDS film and trying to, you know, realizing I needed to understand more than I did before I would take on the responsibility of trying to say anything publicly. And I went, as it happens, I, I ended up going to Harvard through, you know, various forms of luck. And I thought I was going someplace where I was going to learn deep knowledge about the world, kind of like I was going to Hogwarts, you know, to finally, you know, learn learn the spells. And one thing I'm realized, I only just realized as as we're because we're here to talk about it, is that all the libraries I went into, the you know the the main library, Widener, or the medical library, where I spent a lot of time, all of them were are constructed with a sort of theatricality. You know, you enter them with this, you know, you, these these edifices that convey to you that you're you're about to learn what matters, and I'm very lucky to have done that and to done to have done it in that place because what I learned there is that if you keep digging what you come up with is a lot of a lot of very interesting research that completely contradicts you know each each thing you learn contradicts something else you learned and ultimately you're left with no choice but to make a choice you know you just you just have to decide what feels right and what seems right and what what you want to believe in and then pursue that, and I, but I and I realized how tricky it is to base what you think you know on the world of research as psychiatry is based on, because it it presents people the opportunity to believe whatever they really want to, and so ultimately, ultimately I realized that this journey, you know, through what I thought was going to be learning how to know was really learning the value of what I had been doing in film, which is to really understand the, you know, that the poetry, the musicality, you know, the sense of what you're trying to say is as impactful. I mean, it, it, you know, that ultimately here, you know, when, when, when I was talking with Don, I, I realized all these years of doing this work and trying to find ways to you know, have some impact, uh, now that I do actually really know, know what I believe and feel comfortable in believing it, that I feel comfortable trying to create something to go out into the world that will have touched people on a level beyond words, beyond research, beyond arguments, and just, you know, where people will be caught up in, in the poetry and the beauty of what's being said. So that explains why you think this would be a good subject for uh, for an opera, which was a question I asked Don. And before I go further, because there's a question of tone here and something you both have brought up, when you look at this subject initially, or you're immersed in it, you see a lot of pain, you see a lot of suffering, you see a lot of lost lives, uh, you get this sense of betrayal for, since what happens in this world is so different than what you've been told. Don addressed this. Yet your the title of this opera is For Life. So this is throwing this out to both of you. How did you come up with this title and and why? I know that I had come to realize that this that these words for life was a it was like a prison sentence. For example, the this belief that antidepressants unmask serious uh, serious mental illness when 
it really seems like they're causing it. But this is a great sales marketing plan for the drug companies because now they can sell these drugs for life. And at the same time, the the one thing that everyone needs, um, because there are many different different ways of improving your mental health and it all depends on the individual what they're going through and what the causes are but one thing that everyone needs for life is a caring community that they can go to and um and that will never change and i didn't want the opera to end in despair i wanted there to be hope because i had i had read and I, I knew people that had gotten through and off of these drugs and they had experienced a lot of loss, but they now were recapturing their lives. So um, so this these words for life have two meanings in this opera. You know, that's really interesting. I can see the two meanings provide you sort of with a narrative arc through the opera, obviously. Kermit, real quickly, so you write the libretto, and on very first uninformed glance, it seems like a subject that might be good for Gilbert and uh, Gilbert and Sullivan touch, play with words and all the double meanings and that sort of thing. So what was your approach to the language you wanted to use in the libretto? Uh, well, first, I, I, I really considered my role to help Don, and... I think that for me, one of the greatest things that's come out of this is our working relationship and what I've learned from the, this and for what I hope and expect we will do in the future. Um, so that one thing I know now better than I did is that you don't just write a libretto. You talk about the ideas, you put down some ideas about what the words might be, what the you know important words you're aiming for. But the process, ideally, is done together. Uh, you know that you shape. I mean, because there's just the simple fact that I write words, or that somebody somebody writes words, doesn't mean that a composer uh, should or even could just set those to music. Um, you know, it's an interactive process of you know really understanding what is the deep meaning here and what are the fewest number of words that can convey it. So I actually made the mistake starting off to just, I wrote a bunch of things and I had a great time doing it, but uh, that really burdened Dawn in a way. Uh, and then she rightly, you know, hacked uh, up what I did and, you know, made it work uh, for what she was trying to do, which was, of course, the goal here. Um, and uh, in, in my opinion, I mean, I have ideas and thoughts and certainly a lot of experiences uh, that I was happy to bring to the table. But uh, to, to go back to your original question, I mean, it was interesting that I think one of the, one of the real moments at which it really started to feel like we were going to be able to make something worthwhile was, you know, it had to do with uh, a concept that I'd been trying to figure out how to convey the deep paradox and irony and uh, indescribable um, tragedy of, which is a, there's this, uh, without, I'll try not to go into the whole concept, but there's this legal term called uh, the um, learned intermediary that's been an instrument uh, that pharmaceutical companies have hid behind in lawsuits and escaped lots of judgments by basically passing the responsibility off to the doctors. And the doctors, of course, they're basing all of their decisions so, almost solely on research that's been provided by the pharmaceutical companies. So it's this perfect Catch twenty two that it's it's been inescapable. Uh, so many lawsuits have have you know run up against that wall, this that impenetrable wall against culpability. And um, and I for a long time I thought, how is it possible to describe just the the, the, the elegance and ex exquisite you know venality of this? And uh, I, I, I really, I've actually tried over the years to write something about it. Nothing came close to it uh, until suddenly it seemed, I, I realized that the phrase learned intermediary fell perfectly as a substitute for modern major general. <laughs> and then, 
you know, I mean, you you, re- you referred to Gilbert and Sullivan a little offhand as you know wordplay and games, but when you really watch what they're doing, they're taking social, often very deep social quandaries and ironies, and setting them to music in a delightful way. But they work because the energy is driven by the fact that they're capturing aspects of their society that are absurd. And so when I when I realized that we could do that, and I thought, oh my God, we we can really do something here. And you know, I think in truth uh, that exists in the opera in the finished form. You know, you, there's kind of a, an echo of it of that joke. Uh, but to do justice to the subject, in which I mean, really the main thing driving this is that I've talked to so many people on so many different psychiatric drugs where the the level of suffering and the absolute Kafkaesque, or or maybe better word would be Wagnerian level of um, almost mythical, you know, uh, the, the world that they're lost in is, is just hard to convey to people who have never, who are fortunate enough to have never had to come in con- direct contact with it. It's hard to con- it's hard to express it. And I realized we have a chance to give it a shot here. Yeah, so this brings up a question for both of you, uh, both in the composition of the, 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 the libretto and in the you know the composition itself. Is and Don, you mentioned this earlier about what the audience will bring, the conceptions the audience will bring to this opera. And there may be if people who have personal experience and have been in the, you know, some of the support groups you're talking about, they will be primed to receive it, to understand this narrative that you're, you know, the story you're telling. But you also said, you know, you you, you came to Kermit because in part because you were worried about being seen as a conspiracy theorist. And anyone who does challenge the conventional medical wisdom around this gets that hurled at them. And many in your audience might have that same, I don't know, orientation when they when they first come to the opera. So I'm just wondering how a how you uh, conceive of your audience and how you will negotiate. You know the fact that your audience will be bringing different understandings to this subject and quite contradictory understandings. Yes, I I thought about this a lot before I wrote the opera and and now I'm already experiencing it. I understand especially in the music world actually there there are many people who are taking psychiatric medications and I have different theories about why that is. I I think that part of what makes us musicians is that we do have a um even kind of a physical hypersensitivity and um, awareness of our surroundings. And this can be hard emotionally. And it is not popular to say anything negative about these medications. And I can only say that if you look at the marketing strategies of the drug companies, there it is. And if you start looking under the surface to where the money flows, then if you're a, you know, a thinking person, you can at least acknowledge that if you yourself are not, uh, you know, feeling that these medications harmed you, that it's wrong to deny that it's happening to others. So, In our current political situation, issues like racism and sexual abuse and um, discrimination are all really, you know, coming to light and being discussed. And uh, one of the issues is, is, um, you know, that's coming out is, is when someone says, well, I've never seen this, so it, it doesn't exist. And I would say the same thing about the psychiatric medication harm. Um, and I also have experienced and seen how um, if someone is, 
doesn't understand how these medications work on your brain. And their physician is very kind and supportive and telling them that they need this, that it's, it's really difficult to believe that you've been sold something that's not true. And I would say I have the deepest, deepest empathy for, you know, emotional um, crises and mental health crises, and that we need a society that has, that offers support. Um, I'm not uh, shaming anyone who is on these medications because they certainly experienced something that they, they needed support. And uh, I think that it's, it's possible that for very serious crisis situations that medications could be used, could be perhaps if there are no other possibilities and it's a life-saving issue. But the, the problem is, is that then people are being told they, they need them forever. So I am, you know, I'm aware that there will be criticism. And the other thing I have to say is, is that I would never claim that this opera, that the music, that the music comes close to actually capturing the suffering that occurs. It's an attempt, uh, but um, we had time constraints and we had COVID issues that we had to work with. Like I had to compose something that could be, um, the, the orchestra players were separated, they were distanced. And so it's hard for them to hear each other. There was limited time for rehearsing. The singers had to sing to a recording, which is totally different. So um, I look at this actually as a work in progress. I am really interested in seeing how um, it was uh, staged and the, and the and the work that Scott put into it to make to bringing this to life. But um, I am prepared for questions and criticism, but I decided that it it was something that I could not not say. It was something I was going to say no matter what. I think it's a brave thing to do, to be honest with you, because uh, you are opening yourself up to cri criticisms of sort of um, unfair sort, <laughs> you know, not for the subject matter as opposed to the sort of creativity and the artistic representation of what you're doing. Uh, you know, it, it is a political world out there around this subject for sure. And people f do feel very defensive. You know, I have to say, I regret one thing is I wish I could see this in, with a live performance. I mean, I understand because of COVID and all, and it, it's going to be interesting to see how they stitch it all together. But, you know, one of the things and, and what you've been talking about is how opera reaches us emotionally too, not just through some sort of the language and all, but there's, it's a whole experience. And I would really like to sit in an opera theater and watch it and feel it and, you know, feel the instruments sort of beating in my heart, so to speak. So I hope that day comes. Uh, Kermit, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, and before I say that, I'll just uh, say if anybody could pull off, uh, you know, something that's going to be worth seeing online, uh, I think it would be Scott Skiba uh, and the and the Cleveland Opera Theater. I mean, uh, the other things I've seen by them were just staggering and stupendous in ways that I've I've never even imagined opera would be. Uh, what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to pick up on, you know, on this theme of uh, being painted as a sp conspiracy theorist and, you know, or wrong or whatever it is people want to say. Um, I mean, this is why it's good. It was good for Don and I to have a dialectic. Uh, you know, of course, we're all tempted to just say the things that we emotionally want to say and leave it to the future to sort out, you know. The nuances. Uh, it's a good thing to have a you know a dialectic process where, we're, for instance, at a certain point we realize you know we had a lot of fun creating a, a, a the character of a psychiatrist uh, that we could just ridicule and you know who you know he, he got what he deserved 
you know, that was fun and satisfying to do, but at a certain point after you know, we just looked, you know, looked at each other, um, online, of course, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and said, you know, we can't, you know, this isn't, this isn't, we're not being truthful if we don't also show the humanity of this person. You know, we're obligated to do that. That's just not, you, it's not right to not, to fit, that would be, it would be a failure not to. And so when Dawn said, uh, you know, as a, as evidence of hope that she's known people who got off the drugs. I thought what I thought at that moment was we have to be careful to make the drugs themselves the issue as, because then we're falling into the same trap as people who are telling us that the drugs are the issue that, you know, they're saying that people need to be on them and we're, and then we end up arguing that they don't and that that's the issue. Uh, and all those may be very true in certain ways. Um, you know, I think if you look at the science, if you really look at, you know, the history, the epidemiology, all of it, there's a very strong argument that a lot of people have been harmed. But I look to some of the successes, what I would consider successes in, in my career, not for whether or not a person got off the drugs necessarily, but for whether they stopped thinking of themselves as somebody who was aberrant or a monster or not a full citizen. Uh, and that was independent of whether or not they continued to take drugs because it, it ends up being, you know, I mean, I, I mean, if for no other reason than the fact that once somebody has been on some of these drugs for a period of time, it may not be possible for them not to be. And also the fact is we live in a world where once, if other people think you should be taking them, it's very, very difficult to not be taking them. It's, you know, we, we can't expect people to act as if they don't live in that world. Um, and so, we have to be thoughtful about it. You know, we're not, you know, to, to, to start to make it ideological or political and just say, it, you know, it must be this way or the world falls short of our expectations. Other people are going to get caught in the wheels of that in ways that can be tragic. And I don't want to, I don't want to be responsible for that. Right. Two last quick questions here. One is whenever you engage in, a, in creating a work of art, uh, you usually come out of it different than you entered it. In other words, you, your own thinking about it changes, evolves, deepens. And so for each of you, sort of quickly as, you know, sort of succinctly as possible, in what ways did your own thinking and your own emotional approach to the subject change as the result of doing this, creating this, co-creating this work of art? And I guess I'll start with you, Don. I guess I realized I was just peeling layers that there was always more to learn um, and that it was, um, that there are many facets to this, to this issue but one thing that became really clear to me is, or clearer, I would say, is what is art? Um, because that word is used, for example, in psychiatry to say, well, um, diagnosis is an art and a science. And I don't think that the word that someone who says that for diagnosing actually knows what art is. I hate to say it, but art is not <laughs> guesswork. And it's not just throwing out your emotions and your feelings without any knowledge. It's a very detailed work. It's actually if you you are the artist, you're making decisions, you're not, you're not just throwing things down and there's structure and there's detail it's very detailed and there's not there's not room for big errors in music if you play a piece with you know a, a b level piece i'm saying in, in academic terms you get a b well that's not a terrible grade if you play music with 20 percent of the notes wrong it's going to sound like chaos and not music. So if you want to say that prescribing is like an art, then then you have to throw away all this uh, big, huge margins for errors. I just have to throw in quickly that the performers for this are 
Baldwin Wallace College students, uh, conservatory students. So rather than, uh, Scott is the director of the Cleveland Opera Theater, and he is the director of the Baldwin Wallace uh, Opera Program. And this particular festival involves, I, I believe, mostly Baldwin Wallace students. Oh, that's good to know. I was actually going to ask you about that. Uh, Kermit, real quickly on this, the same thing about, uh, were you transformed in some ways by the experience? Well, in, in, yeah. Uh, one is, <laughs> I would say, uh, it's hard to be engaged in this field, in this, you know, in this, in this area, and not be drawn into despair. It's pretty hard, I and mean, I've seen a lot of it. And, and yeah, uh, I mean, as as you know, we 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 lead, uh, we, we lead a group for Madden America every week of people who meet, you know, fam parents and family members who meet to talk about what they're going through. And and I'll be honest, at the <laughs> there was a time where, for me, participating in that meeting was was it was hard. Because you know, just story after story after story of people who just, it's, you know, it was a, it was little to hope for. It seemed, but concurrently with writing, with working on this with Don, which by by the way, I'll just I'll just say here too, as I think one of the great outcomes for me is to participate in a project whereby the world will learn more about how brilliant Don is, and not just musically. I mean, I think you hear in this interview. I mean, her her insight. You know, her her she's she's just ex extraordinarily insightful and thoughtful, and uh, it's just a you know been a real honor, has been, and continues to be a real honor to be able to to work with such a person. Um, and so it's it's all that. I mean, I, uh, somehow or another, even over the time of doing this, uh, participating in that parent support group. I think we have been able to, we have started to see a little bit of light uh, just through the gathering, just through the being with the people, you know, with each other to reinforce for each other the things that we uh, see that we know are wrong, that it's hard to find words for how wrong they are, and, and then to find the pieces of hope that we didn't know were there, and, and then to celebrate them and, 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 and feel them together. And so, in a way, being able to do this project was kind of, is kind of a, an echo of that, a, par a parallel to that, of just realizing, well, yeah, you don't get to experience some of the great joys in life and unless you are willing to go down into some of the, the hardest places. Um, everything else is just pretending or, you know, whistling past the graveyard. I mean, when you really go in there, then you say, oh, this, is, this was real and this mattered. And so that's that's what I got out of this is just a reminder that it's worth doing all it's worth engaging, you know, both with suffering this deep and with aspirations this great, uh, just to arrive at a point of realizing this was worth it. I like that ending as a, a sort of a hopeful moment and a moment of light on a subject that can be so dark. I I can just say that that Kermit, uh, what he captured was both the this biting satire in the in the character of the drug rep it's just wonderful and we laughed a lot when we talked about that but the words that that um come to mind right away is is she sort of screams i curse you all with anisognosia <laughs> and <laughs> and then but then at the at the end, it's a, he has very uh, moving lines. Um, this is a dialogue between a son who has been harmed and the mother. And the mother says, I saw your face before you were born.
so this opera has both biting satire, but also just beautiful, intimate language in it. Well, I can't wait to see it. And I also can't wait to see, hopefully there'll be a day I can sit in a, in a, a live theater. Now, there's going to be a discussion afterwards too, isn't that correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, this has been really a delight for me to learn about this and to speak to you both. And I can't wait to see the opera. I'm really looking forward to it. It really sounds like a great piece, quite moving in many ways. And I think people will be laughing, maybe crying, and it's going to be quite the 30 minutes. For our listeners, you can find information about the opera on madinamerica.com and also on this website, bwvp.org forward slash for life. All right. So thank you both for joining us today. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.